Um, I don't know why the AP class and books are structured this way, but after we've talked about forces on things in magnetic fields, we need to talk about where magnetic fields come from. And so, <clears throat> it's, pre it's pretty straightforward, but um, any moving charge will create a magnetic field. Any moving charge creates a magnetic field. That's just how that's just how it works. So um, when we have permanent magnets, we have on the atomic scale little tiny magnetic dipoles all lined up just perfectly. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Little tiny magnetic dipoles all lined up permanently, perfectly, north north, north, south, south, south. Um, so all of the molecules in there have the same direction that they're pointing in. So the total object ends up having that. Um, things like iron, well, most other things have, have molecules, obviously, but the, the magnetic dipole in those things points in random directions which is why we don't have a permanent magnet for the object. Now things like iron, um, we can take and align those things to make them temporarily magnetized, but over time they will randomize themselves. Okay. Um, and again, if we just have an electron that has a velocity, it will create a magnetic field. And, and we're going to talk about this on the next slide, but that magnetic field tends to swirl around the electron in its direction of motion. Um, but there's not a lot of times that we're trying to actually get a magnetic field from the ob an object. So the place that we really see that is in current carrying wires. We use the magnetic field from current carrying wires to do everything. This is how we get electromagnets. So essentially, I have a wire, and that wire is a current, which means I've got a whole bunch of positive charges moving in a certain direction. Now, around that wire, I'm going to get a magnetic field that loops around it. Magnetic field looping around that wire. So if I take that wire and I make the wire into a loop like that, let's say the current's going this way, because the magnetic field is looping around it like that, I get pretty consistent inwardly directed magnetic field here and an outwardly directed magnetic field here. Just I went that backwards. I get an inwardly directed magnetic field here and an I'm sorry, an outwardly directed magnetic field there and an inwardly directed magnetic field here, just based on looping that thing up. If I put a bunch of loops together, I get a real magnet. We looked at that a little bit last year in pre-AP and we might, might look at it a little bit again uh, today. <clears throat> this is where the magnetic field comes from. What we're going to do is look at how to calculate it. For that, we use the Biosavart Law. Why is it called the Biosavart Law? Because two French guys worked on it, and that were, the, that were their names. Biosavart Law. So, the Biosavart Law says is that for a single charge, the magnetic field is equal to mu zero, we'll talk about that, over four pi, times the charge, times the velocity, crossed with the radius, is also a vector divided by the radius cubed. That looks terrible. And we really need to talk about a couple of things here. First off, this mu zero is called the permeability it's a tough word of free space. 
And just like the permittivity of free space, it's just telling me how empty space reacts to having a magnetic field put through it. And it's a real number. For us, it's going to be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. And the units on that are a little crazy. We're just going to say newtons per amps squared. Um, that's what mu zero is. This is this this right here is a little bit unfamiliar to us. Um, so, as far as magnitude is concerned, for the bios of art law, because of all this cross product stuff, it's mu zero over four pi. It's our constant times QV over R squared sine theta, where theta is the angle between V and R. That's what goes into that. Direction, because we have to look at both of them, direction is determined by this QV cross R part. That's why we have it in there. This part we use for magnitude, this part we use for direction. But that's why there's this r and r cubed stuff. It works 1 over r squared, like it should. We have to write it down in a funny way. So what this tells me um, is that if I have a charged particle moving with a velocity v, and I want to figure out the magnetic field at a point here that is r away, I point my pointer finger in the direction of v, my middle finger in the direction of r, and the direction that your thumb points in, which in, in this case is out of the page, is the direction of your magnetic field. And that's the magnitude of it. If we wanted to go to a point over here, R would be here, and we'd have to look at the angle between R and V. We don't do a lot with it for single charges. What we do, we're going to have to look at a lot, uh, and this is... A little difficult is the differential magnetic field that comes from a piece of current carrying wire mu zero over four pi times I DL cross R over R cubed. All right, <clears throat> this is for a current carrying wire. This is going to help us determine the magnetic field from that. So, again, uh, the magnitude, with the magnitude, it's uh, dB is equal to mu zero IDL over 4 pi r squared. That's how we determine the magnitude. This is where we're going to be doing a lot of our, our math times the sine of the angle in between them. Um, the direction is determined by current crossed with the radius. That's how we determine the direction of that. So we're going to look at just one example here in a second. But this comes from, let's say I have a piece of current carrying wire. has current I in it. And we're over here at this point. We have to take a differential piece of this length, dl times I currents in that direction again and look at the magnetic field caused at that point over here point P a distance of R away the magnetic field caused by this tiny piece of the current here and that's going to give me a differential magnetic field now in this case R points this way I points that way I is that way R is. so if you use the right hand rule you see that the magnetic field the differential piece of magnetic field points out of the page we're not going to have to do it for a straight piece of wire. It involves trig substitution and it's nasty. There's really, really just one case that we have to look at. So here's our example for the BIOS of Art Law. Let's imagine we have a loop of wire and in that loop we have current I. And what we want is to find the magnetic field B at point 
P. That's what we're after. Find the magnetic field B at point P. So, this is a familiar process, or at least it should be. We're going to take a differential piece of this length, DL, which is a length of R away from point P. R points, well, R points to point P from my wire. Okay. And in this case, the current at DL is coming out of the page. We're going to have a differential magnetic field from that. Now, as far as direction is concerned, okay, point your pointer finger out of the page at you, your middle finger at R. And what we're going to have is a tiny piece of the magnetic field here pointing up at 90 degrees from that radius R. But we also have to consider on the other side of this thing there's another piece of DL with this time the current going into the page because it's loop with a similar R. And that's going to give me a differential piece of magnetic field, dB, down in this direction. So when we're looking at this, we only want this portion of it. dB, and if this angle is theta, times the sine of theta. So, we're going to use the Bios of Art law to set all of this stuff up. Hopefully it's not that bad. We'll see what happens. So, it's uh, dB is equal to mu zero I dL divided by um, 4 pi R squared times the sine of the angle, oh, sorry, times the sine of the angle between these two. Now, that gives me dB. Everything's at 90 degrees, so I'm kind of done there. But because of symmetry considerations, we need to look at the sine theta part of this. It looks kind of hard to set up, but when we take the integral of both sides, going from 0 to B, so that gives me the magnetic field B, mu 0 I and 4 pi don't change, so mu 0 I over 4 pi. R squared, R is just this. That doesn't change as I go to different points along this. So I've got r squared. And again, sine theta doesn't change as I go to different points along here. Times the sine of theta on the integral of dl. So that gives me uh, mu zero i times the sine of theta divided by 4 pi r squared times the integral of dl, which is just the length of this loop. It's the circumference, so 2 pi r. Pi goes away, one of my r's go away. And the magnetic field is mu 0 over 2 times i over r times the sine of theta. Now, we have to plug in for sine theta. Sine theta I know is a over r, and I know that r is the square root of a squared plus b squared. So really, once we do it all, mu zero i over 2 times a over a squared plus b squared to the 3 halves. We just did the Bios of Art law. We may look at a more complicated example in class, but this is what we need to know how to do.